All right, everyone, welcome to our yet another mission, mission number nine for this Kubernetes bootcamp or the Kubernetes masterclasses series. And uh, let's uh, understand where we stand right now. And um, we'll get started with today's topic as well. How's everyone doing, by the way? You can say hi in the chat. Where are you joining from? Which city? You can put that in the chat as well. Uh, we have people from the YouTube stream. We have uh, some people in uh, the Zoom channel. A um, few more might join in as well. So here we are uh, talking about, um, let's say, um, uh, something which is very interesting today. Uh, so far, we have gone through these many topics. So we started with these many missions. So Containerize was the mission where we started building container images, uh, talked about pods, podification. Scalify was about uh, replica sets. How do we scale applications with replica sets, um, autoscaler, et cetera. We went through the Kubernetes networking, learned about ingress, uh, learned to deploy the application, worked with the persistent storage, worked with, uh, learned about the security related concepts. Um, and now, uh, yes, or last week we talked about HEM as well, interesting topic. And today we're actually gonna combine this productionize and adminify because a lot of these things are just kind of uh, go together. And uh, uh, we'll basically talk about a few things uh, which include, <clears throat> so today's topics are gonna be in including these things. So we'll get started talking about uh, Mainly, how do you set up Kubernetes cluster, right? So how do we set up uh, Kubernetes cluster uh, using kubeadm? So that's how you typically set up your you know, production like clusters, environments, and so on. Maybe some are high available setup, some are not. We'll take up a simpler version of the setup, uh, a non-HA kind of environment, uh, but it will be something that is officially recommended and uh, that's how the real clusters are set up as well pretty much um we will not get into the ha part though uh, after we have set up the cluster i'll show you how to add or join uh, additional nodes we will join the nodes during the setup itself but after that uh, in future if you have to bring in more nodes how do you do that uh, we will talk about that we will then also talk about uh, how do we upgrade the nodes, right? And when we upgrade the nodes at that time, we will also be taking up some topics, including how do we uh, run some admin administration tasks, right? Uh, and that includes upgrading the node itself, right? And uh, there are certain commands. Um, so admin commands rather, I would say, and that includes how do we Cord on a node. Uh, how do we taint and then? Uh, so before that, I'll probably talk about um, one more topic that is about, uh, let's say, how do we um, make the master node schedulable, right? So this is about uh, taints, right? And how do we upgrade the nodes is where we'll take up. Uh, how do we, you know, let's say, uh, cord on the nodes. How do we uncordon the nodes? How do we drain the nodes? Uh, so cordon and uncordon goes together. All right, so I hope you're all excited to learn about these topics. And finally, we'll talk about how do we uh, backup and restore etcd, which is one of the essential components of uh, this cluster. So I will show you a step-by-step -step process right from how do we bring the nodes and then connect them together to form a cluster. That's going to be the first part. And uh, then I would show you in this sequence how uh, we'll go step by step, talk about each of these topics, and uh, I'll demonstrate these things to you as well, right? So right from the time, I'll get started by setting up the nodes first, right? So I need to create a cluster with uh, three nodes. Uh, that's what I'm going to get started with. So by the way, if you are joining for the first time, you um, can interact by, you know, basically tap typing in the chat. Uh, you can ask questions, post your questions. I would look at those questions time to time and try to answer those as well, right? And uh, I hope my screen is visible to everyone and I'm audible. Yes, no? Yeah, it's good. 
Awesome. Okay. Yes, YouTube live is go going on, Sandan. So yes, we are live on YouTube as well. Um. All right. So let's get started. Um, I want to bring up three notes. So I'll tell you what I'm doing and uh, uh, what kind of setup I'm trying to create here. So let me try and connect my iPad first so that I can visually explain to you. All right. So we'll be setting up three nodes and forming a cluster out of it. Okay. So how will that look like? Let me quite quickly explain. So all the previous uh, demonstrations that I've shown and the setup that I had done was on just one node, but using kind based environment, we simulated like three to four nodes. Uh, in this case, it's going to be three real nodes as in, um, I will be using three cloud servers here and one of that will be set up as the control plane. And the other nodes are just the worker nodes, or you can call them as worker nodes, or you can call them as nodes, right? So two worker nodes and one dedicated control plane is what we will begin with. And uh, I would be using a tool called as Kubeadium. That's the official way how uh, Kubernetes clusters are set up as well. So how do I get started? Is by first provisioning the nodes. How do I provision the nodes? In this case, I'm gonna create three VMs on a cloud called as DigitalOcean, which is what I commonly use for most of these demonstrations. And I'm just choosing a region uh, which has been working great for me. Uh, and uh, I've selected a template, which is Ubuntu, which is 23.10, uh, which is the latest version of Ubuntu. I'm just gonna stick to that. And I'll select a size of the server. This is gonna be sufficient for me right now. And uh, then uh, generally I, add a script. So I want the essential things to be set up like kubeadm, the container runtime. Uh, earlier used to be Docker, but now it is, let's say, uh, something like uh, container D or could be cryo, right? So I generally run something called the user data script. Uh, and it looks like this, for example, right? So I'll just show you the script as well. So this starts with the basic, some basic system configurations. And then it installs the container D here. This is probably the container D installation. All of these steps lead to the container D installation. And once the container D is started, uh, then we set up a uh, kube ADM, kube CTL, kubelet, and so on, right? Generally, that is the process. I'm gonna show you how to install kube ADM this time on one node, and then I'll run this as a script on the others, right? So I will not set up, generally, uh, I select this option here, in um, advanced to run some initialization script. This is where I paste my script typically. Uh, I will not do uh, that entire thing actually, uh, right? So I'll not actually put any script here yet, right? And I'll just provision the nodes, three nodes here, one, two, three, and uh, go, right? So I'm creating three nodes, which are running Ubuntu 23.10, and those uh, nodes, is what I would connect to here and then start setting up everything on, right? That's where I'm gonna set up the cluster with. Now, how do I go about it? How do you go about it and so on is uh, I'm gonna follow today for majority of the things I will follow uh, the documentation, the official documentation, kubernetes.io. One of the reasons why I would want to do that is because if you're preparing for CKA or CKAD exam, it is an open book exam. You probably know about it. And one of the most important resources for that is this uh, uh, documentation portal, which is what you have free access to uh, throughout the exam. And you must use this to your advantage. And how would you do that is what I will be demonstrating by referring through, uh, through, through this documentation for most of the parts, except for some setup instruction, I'll uh, use something else. But uh, for majority of the part, for example, how do I set up, uh, uh, you know, cluster setup, for example, with uh, kubeadm. Or if I want to set up a high available cluster, there is a documentation available for me, right? So I can use this Kubernetes cluster with kubeadm. This is what I can reference uh, typically. And uh, you can find out which uh, typically it will take you to the documentation on Kubernetes. There are other resources like forums also. 
but uh, for the exam part, mostly you're going to reference the, the, some of the documentation. You also have high available cluster setup design here. Now, uh, this is where I said we're not doing this because this needs a much more elaborate uh, resources setup and a lot of time uh, to be spent because a lot of things you have to do externally, like you have to set up a load balancer and you need to bring like six nodes as per the documentation. And uh, then you uh, do the setup and there are multiple steps. Uh, you have to do SSH, passwordless SSH and all that. So it'll take a few hours uh, just to demonstrate this part. So I'm not getting into that right now, but those of you who are interested, you can reference the documentation from uh, the Kubernetes.io. Uh, Kubadium is the, the go-to tool for setting up the Kubernetes clusters, um, you know, and then you have other tools or sitting on top of that, like Kubespray and everything else, uh, Cops and Kubespray, which can come in handy in certain environments where you have to set up a multi-node environment and so on. Kubespray or tools like that can make it easier as well. Now, if you have to set up Kubeadm uh, or install cluster with Kubeadm, you can reference the documentation. You have to first prepare your node uh, with some system configuration, network set settings and stuff like that. And then you can bring in the container images if you want to. I'm not doing that. I'm on cloud, so it happens very quickly. So I don't have to worry about that. And then I would show you by initializing the control plane that part onward where I would use Kubernetes in it with some specific options that work for me. And uh, then I would go and set up everything else, right? So that's uh, uh, what I will begin with once I have the nodes ready and I should be able to connect to them now. I have three nodes ready, uh, which I've opened three windows here. So I'm gonna connect to these three nodes. Uh, looks like it's not yet ready. So it's denying me the connection, which typically means it takes a couple of minutes for it to initialize. I'll just have everything ready though. So that as soon as it comes up, I can uh, just start connecting. In the meanwhile, uh, as you can see that it's working. The first node is, uh, all right. Okay. Trying to see why it's denying the connection. Maybe it's not been set up yet. That's typically what I would expect uh, because these are identical nodes. So if this works and this works, I expect uh, this node to also work the same way. Still denying me the connection. That's strange. If you want to find out what's going on with SSH, you can use minus V for Bobos. And uh, you can see that it's trying out the keys, a bunch of keys that I have available with me. And uh, so far, the only thing that signifies, uh, I mean, it's a public key based authentication, which works, which should work. And uh, the server is up, uh, looks like it's trying to accept the public key authentication. And uh, that did not work for some reason. That's when it sort of uh, does this kind of a thing. Uh, okay, I found the issue actually, I'm trying to connect from another server. So that's why it's not working. I should be on my local host actually. So my bad. Okay. I'm connected to three nodes. And uh, now I will start setting up the cluster. If I go back here, this is my first node. This is the second, this is the third. I want to make this as a control plane. What does that mean is I have to initialize this as a control plane. How would I do that is uh, using a command called as kubeadm in it, okay? So kubeadm is the Kubernetes, you can call it as Kubernetes cluster admin. Is it installed? Not yet, right? That's what I want to begin with. Now I want to show you how to install kubeadm, but apart from that, it needs, uh, let's say, before even kubeadm is installed, 
you need to have a container runtime, right? So you can see that uh, preparing the host has component installation, uh, talks about installing kubeadm. If I go to installing kubeadm, uh, it may it shows me which version of kubeadm I can choose and so on. Currently it is v version 1.29, but I'm gonna pick one version less, 1.28, because I want to show you how to upgrade from 1.28 to 1.29, because there's a process involved there, right? Uh, but you also need to install the container runtime. Now this part I'm gonna skip because it's just a bunch of instructions, right? So uh, what I'll do is the part till I'm installing container D is what I'm just gonna uh, run as a script. So I'm copying this pasting it into a file and just uh, let this go. Okay. The second and the third nodes, I'm gonna run this script all the way, right? I'll show you the installation part only on one node. That should be sufficient. So the second and the third node, I will just run that script and it's going to have everything ready by the time I'm done with the first node demonstrating that. Okay, on the first node, I should have a container D. Yeah, so CTR is a command, which is a container D CLI. If it is installed, I know that it's running. Uh, I can also check the service if it is running using system CTL because system CTL container D has started. So I can also use that to check whether uh, container D is running or not. Now, how do I install kube ADM is the part I wanna show you. And I wanna install a specific version of kube ADM that is 1.28. So I'll go to 1.28. And now uh, the way Kubernetes kube ADM gets installed has changed. You cannot just install the latest version or something. You have to use a specific version and install that. And if that's the reason why every version has its own set of instructions now. Uh, I have the container runtime installed. I will install kubeadm. To do so, I will pick my distribution, uh, which is Debian-based distribution. I have Ubuntu. I'm not using Red Hat or without package manager. I'm installing it using Ubuntu. So on Ubuntu, uh, I have to run. So sudo is not needed because I'm running as root. So I can just run without sudo. I start uh, adding. Uh, the basic packages. So you can see some dependencies being, being installed. Uh, that should be very straightforward. This is where we add the repository. The repository is where the packages come from. So if I install this repository, it will only install that particular version of uh, Kubanium. And you can see that it's 1.28. It's in the URL here uh, for that repository. So it gives me the packages, which are, uh, let's say if I run apt update or apt get update i am used to apt get so i can run apt get update after installing adding the repository and then i can search for it so there is a command to search uh, for the packages let me remember it's a very peculiar command it actually doesn't look like a command that's why I'll show you. How do I upgrade the nodes is where there is a specific command I will look. I'll show you anyways, we are going to upgrade the cluster later. So I'll keep this handy. Yeah, Madison is a command. Uh, it used to be a utility actually to list the packages which are available and the version of that is available in the uh, repository. And uh, I'm going to use this command and show you what is available right now. Okay. I probably need another repository. Let me go back to the instructions and see, this is just a key. Okay. This seems to be the repository. Yeah. Yeah, now it should be available in this repository. And 
you can see it has this particular version of uh, this package. This command is also useful because later on, when you want to upgrade, which version would you want to upgrade? And if you are preparing for the exam, uh, you are going to have a Ubuntu environment. So you, this, these are the commands you'll have to know about. And uh, even if you don't know about, at least be able to reference the documentation so that you can find this these answers or these commands uh, with from there. And then I would uh, install kubedium along with kubectl, kubectl, um, and so on. We've talked about architecture. So kubedium is the admin tool. Kubectl is the client that we use, just like Docker. We use kubectl, get pods, kubectl something. And kubelet is the daemon which runs on every node, which is responsible for running the pods on that, right? So that's the difference. So you need to know about those three things and what is the difference between it. And now I have, uh, let's say, kubadium installed with the version, which is 1.28. Uh, do remember that because we'll come back to it later. And then I should have kubadium installed uh, already on other uh, systems as well. One of the things that you would notice is after installing these packages, uh, it does something which is very interesting and I've not run it yet here. So I'm gonna run that. So what it does is basically it sets it, it puts a hold on these packages so that these do not get upgraded, updated accidentally. That is very important because it has to be a deliberate upgrade because there could be breaking changes and suddenly if it updates um, in the middle of the night, your cluster might just stop working uh, or maybe your application, some code somewhere which is being deployed might start breaking. So it has to be always deliberate and that's why uh, you hold the packages so that they don't get upgraded automatically by the system. When you run APT upgrade, for example, uh, it doesn't do anything for these packages. So that's what we do. We mark it. So it's the same on all the systems and all of these three systems have the basic packages which are needed to set up the cluster with are uh, available now. Now, let me go ahead and uh, initialize the first node as the control plane. So I'm gonna make one of the node, this node as a control plane. And to do so, I have to run this kube adm command to initialize that as a control plane. When I do this, uh, what all happens, I will demonstrate that and show you, explain to you. So kube adm in it. Uh, there are certain options you may want to add. I typically add as part of my setup instructions, I add a couple of options here. Now, one of that option may not be use, uh, you know, necessary like pod network cider, but uh, when I added this, there used to be a bug uh, to fix it. I have added, I've continued to use that. And uh, this advertise address is important. This is the IP address of my first node, the control plane node, because, and that has to be available uh, over network wise from my second and the third nodes as well, right? So I have to find out the IP address of my first node, which is this and use it here. Yeah, so my API server advertise address is this. Both of these nodes can connect to that. Uh, and connect to the master through that basically, or the control plane through that. So I'm initializing this cluster or the control plane. What does it do? It does starts with a pre-flight check, pulls the image, which are required. Um, and then after the images are done uh, or pulled, it starts setting up the control plane components. Almost all the control plane components are set up as containers, except for kubelet. Kubelet is a, a utility which runs on every node, which is responsible for running the containers, et cetera. Let me actually take you back to the architectural diagram so that you understand uh, what I'm talking about here. Right, so we're talking about this diagram where you have control plane. Each control plane component has uh, uh, four important components, API servers, controller manager, scheduler, and etcd. etcd stores the state of the cluster. And then every node has kubelet, along with the runtime, which is in this case, container D. 
and there's something called as kube proxy which runs on that node so kubelet is a very important component it does not run as a runtainer but it runs as a system C system D daemon that's what we set up with kube adm and uh, kube ctl actually right and then all of these components would get initialized now that's what is happening here uh, you can see the log the generate the certificate because it, there's a lot of authentication and you know uh, certification is involved and um, then uh, it writes the configurations, creates all those static pod manifest for all of these components, scheduler, API server, controller manager, etcd. All of these are run as pods. And uh, that's what it is doing here. And it uh, says creating static pod manifest for X, Y, Z. So API server, controller manager, scheduler, etcd, etc. And all of that comes up and uh, it says healthy somewhere here and uh, generates rest of the configuration uh, and create some additional components like core DNS, group proxy um, and stuff like that, right? Uh, these are all our add-ons uh, per se, but they are mostly existent or present on all the clusters. Now, how do I bring other nodes is by using this command. Do observe this command, it is a join command. And I copy over this command and I'm gonna run it only on one node right now. Before that, though, I will set up kube ctl, the client, here. Right now, it's not working because it does not have the configuration. Those configurations is what I'm bringing in for kube ctl. And after that, it, this works. Now, if you look at this and observe this, that it only has one node, that two in not ready state. Uh, I'm joining another node. When I join the another node, I copied over some uh, crucial configuration from my control plane node that includes the endpoint on which control plane is available. And then there is a token and then there is a discovered token, right? So there are two sort of credentials, which I copied over. And only if the node has the right secrets, right password, will the control plane allow it to be in to the cluster. So when I press enter here, uh, it goes and joins the node, uh, the cluster, and you can see it appear here. It's still in not ready state. Anyone knows why? What do we need to do here to make them ready? Network. Exactly. So right now the nodes have joined. They're part part of the cluster. They're you know they're allowed to be part of the cluster, but it's still not ready because the network configuration has not been done yet. Uh, why Kubernetes does not do the networking is because Kubernetes does not do the networking on its own. It uses something called as a CNI plugin. Uh, so it uses external network plugin and uh, it uses a standard called a CNI for that, right? So Kubernetes relies on a standard and then there are different implementation based on your net, based on your, you know, physical network, based on your, you know, setup, based on the features that you need, you can pick and choose uh, the network implementation that you want or suits best for you. The most popular being Calico, Weave uh, today. And I'm going to set up a network called as Weave here. So how would I do that is uh, even if you look at this creating cluster, you set up the nodes, you join the nodes, initialize the control plane node. I have done that, uh, showed you how to join the nodes as well. And then you have to install the pod network add-on, right? That's what I'm doing now. And you can pick one of these. So you can see uh, what add-ons are available. There are many. There are many, actually. So there's ACI, Anthera, Calico. I think this is alphabetically ordered. Uh, so I'm going to set up Weave, which is very flexible. Uh, works almost everywhere. Uh, works very wonderfully well everywhere um, that I've um, set it up. So I've used Calico in past, which is very high performance, very popular, but um, um, it does have issues at some, uh, sometimes it doesn't work on certain networks, especially the lab networks that I set up. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So I generally use Weave and uh, it works well everywhere. So how do I go about doing that is, uh, I'm just gonna bring up my lab guide here. Uh, you can reference the Weave networking. Uh, there's a lot of documentation available on also on that official page. Uh, but I'm going to run this command, which sets up the networking, installs the network plugin. 
you see it talks about weave right and then uh, if you see now these nodes will start being ready one at a time yeah this is ready so is the control plane now my cluster is ready pretty much right now uh, i want to install something else which i typically do uh, on my cluster called as uh, visualizer uh, but these are valid this is a validation that it's all working actually get nodes nodes are ready uh, listed i can also do further validation by running kubectl get pods minus capital a shows me everything in the control plane uh, mostly that's what is running right now so kub system is that control plane uh, namespace and uh, now i'm setting up something called as a visualizer what is this visualizer you'll see it in a minute you might have seen my earlier version of it running in a different cluster a tool like this gives you a graphical view overview of your cluster how it's work how you know how what is running uh, what's working how it works so especially when you're learning this is super useful Yeah, uh, from the YouTube live channel, can one of you uh, tell me if you're able to see and hear the session? All right, you can see the cluster here. Okay, I just have two nodes. Now, how do I bring in another node? I can just use the same command, of course, but uh, that works right now uh, because I have a token and that token is typically valid only for 24 hours, okay? So if you want to join additional nodes, how do you do that is, uh, and this could be a question on an exam as well. Let's say you want to join additional node uh, on a Kubernetes cluster. So if you search for it, maybe you find it, uh, no, but this is discussion. We don't want to go into that. We want to uh, use, um, this is not the one. So I will just reference the cluster setup uh, documentation as well only. So if you look at the creating cluster, it has a join node part here, actually. That's where you will find it. Yeah, so this is done. And uh, let's say joining your nodes. Yeah, this is the one. Now, uh, we already have Kubedim installed. And how do we join the node is using this kind of a command. That's what we used earlier as well. Now you need two things here. One is the token. Yeah. Of course, the control plane IP address and the port is needed. But apart from that, two credentials, one is token, one is uh, discovery token CSR hash. Now this is common. This doesn't change. But this token is only valid for 24 hours. Let me show you. So I will go to the control plane node and run kubatm token list and you can see ttl is 23 hours so after 23 hours it's gonna kind of uh, expire uh, you can see the expire when it expires as well so it is only valid for 24 hours what happens after that after that if i want to join this node what do i do right so all you have to do is generate a new token and use that using a command like this now how do i find the uh, rest of the components here right so let me just copy this over and then show you one at a time. There is a command called as kubectl cluster info. Let's look at that. One is it tells me where the control plane is running. It's running on this IP and this port. Now, this is what I want. Generally, it runs on 6443 port. This is what I want in the place of uh, uh, control plane host colon control plane port, the one you see. The one you see here. Now, one of the three inputs are sorted. Uh, what about the hash? Hash you can find out using a command, which this is why the documentation is important because you should know exactly if you're appearing for an exam, bookmark this page because this is something you will need uh, most likely. And when you have to find the discovery token CSR hash, uh, just run this command, gives you the hash, copy it over, 
this one and uh, this hash part is done. Now, all I have to find out is token and I'm assuming the token doesn't exist, it expired. So I will generate one. So kube ADM token create, okay? Just copy that over here. Yeah, token create command is here. This command is already there. You just have to copy paste. And uh, this should join the cluster. Once it joins, you should see it here. You should see it here as well. You can see the node has joined. Uh, not ready yet, that's fine. You see one node. Yeah, one node joined here. And it should be ready in a minute. So now I have a three node cluster. I started with one node, then I added another. And uh, this could be a common question that you've given a cluster and you have to add one more node. And this is typically the process. So you have to use the join command, but you, have, you should know how to find the CSR hash. You should know how to generate a token. And uh, using those, those two, you should be able to join the node uh, to a cluster. So that's done now. Now, let's talk about uh, this master node and let's see if it can be made scalable. What do I mean by that is let me first deploy something. I'm creating a deployment called as web. Uh, I need to provide an image. I need to provide, uh, or I could provide some replicas, let's say 10, right? Now, this is a quick way of generating the code as well. You can also, just do try run is equal to client. If you want to convert it into YAML, you can do this as well. Gives you YAML, which you can add it to a file and work on it, modify it. And this is the quickest way to create the code uh, imperatively, right? So this is the quickest way to create the code without any issues really, because you will not have any syntactical issues. You'll have the right structure and then you can modify from there. And you can do this for deployments, services, and many other things that you can do. Uh, use kubectl create command on. Yeah, you can create these many things. Now, I'm just running this as is. Uh, without these, I'm going to create that deployment right, actually. So that you can see that on the right, it gets deployed only on the nodes, worker nodes. Why does it not run on the control plane? Is the question anyone knows anyone has a clue has an answer to this why it does not these pods do not run on the control plane node uh, Yes, the pods get created only on the worker node, yes. But the question is why? Why not control plane node? Can you make it run on the control plane? Also, the previous question from you, Cedric, about uh, getting the SHA hash, uh, just look up the documentation, you'll find it there. So creating this, you know, setting up the Kubernetes cluster has join node section. <clears throat> the join node section has the command to uh, get that SHA. Yeah, that's where you'll find it. Okay, <clears throat> because as this has kubelet, well, uh, every node has a kubelet, including the control plane, by the way. Even the control plane <clears throat> has kubelet. I think the main goal is to avoid uh, overwhelming the control plane. Yes, that's true. Uh, that's the purpose. Uh, that's the goal. Um, so yes, in a way, kind of a why answer could be that. But uh, I'm talking about, um, okay, so how it is done then. So let's say to, uh, we're dedicating this as a control plane node, which is true. Uh, so answer the why, sure. Uh, how it is done then? So how the control plane is made non-schedulable? Anyone knows about that? Okay.
Okay, let's find out. So this leads to a topic I've already talked about here called as taints. So uh, we can list the nodes. We can also find out more information about the node. Let's say describe uh, the node. Control plane node is this group zero one. And uh, it has a lot of information. And one of that piece of information tells me that there is something called as a taint on this node. You have tainted this node and taint is a property that you add along with an effect. This is a property. Property can be anything. The effect is either no schedule, no execute. And then there is one, uh, one more, right? So uh, it will also evict. So uh, there are two or three properties like that. So no, let's say no schedule or no execute. So this is what makes it non-schedulable basically, right? And this is just a property added on this node. I can remove this property by a, a process called as untainting. And untainting is as simple as taking this property and saying, hey, I'm as if I'm tainting the node and adding that taint, but I'll add a minus at the end. So this property gets removed. As soon as that happens, the master node is now schedulable. That uh, taint is gone. Since the taint is gone, along with the effect, which is the no, no schedule, uh, now if I scale uh, this deployment, whose name is web, and I say, okay, I want to run 15 replicas now. Let's see what happens now. Now uh, all of those came up on the master node. So the control plane node is by, by de facto, it is non-schedulable because of, of course, you don't, you want to dedicate it as a control plane uh, only, but how it is done and can it be made schedulable is what I just showed you. So it is using a taint and it, yes, it can be made uh, schedulable. You can run things on control plane as well if you want to using this approach. Okay. Any questions? That's, yes, go ahead. So... Does that mean you can uh, you can taint any worker node in your cluster if you I mean is it a good strategy to taint any worker node in your cluster in order to uh, do some maintenance in that in that node or there is not a uh, strategy for it? It's not a maintenance purpose. There is a very specific use case for the taints. Actually, one of this is one of it is to make the master node or control plane unschedulable. That's one. You can taint the worker nodes as well when it's not about maintenance. It's more about uh, it's a scheduling strategy. So when would you use it? Uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say you have a node. Um, you have a physical server or a cloud server, which is GPU intensive. Let's say if you look at the cloud and if you look at the type of servers, if you choose some high performance GPU servers, those are very expensive servers. Now, you don't want to just kind of uh, misuse those servers or inefficiently use them by running everything and anything on that server, right? You want to dedicatedly run certain uh, you know, applications which require GPU and that kind of a GPU that you have on that node. So how do you make sure that these particular nodes are reserved only to run a particular type of application is using a taint on a node. So you taint a node and add a property saying that, oh, this is for GPU, just tag, it's a tag. This is for a GPU. And uh, then there is equivalent. Uh, so basically it becomes, you can make it non-schedulable. So it doesn't run anything except, so you can make an exception saying, because you have to run a particular type of application on that node and only that type of application. So what you do is wherever there is a taint, there is an there could be an equivalent toleration. So in a pod spec, the toleration concept is in pod spec. So in the pod spec, you can say, hey, uh, I can tolerate this configuration or this tag uh, so that only that particular, when you see, when it sees the tag, toleration scheduler, it will basically say that, okay, this, it can run on this particular node or it should run on this particular node. So if you want to run a particular type of application on a particular node, the way to do that is by tainting. And the reason why taints exist, why can't we do that with all the scheduling things, right? Like we have affinity rules, we have node selectors, we have this and that. Uh, taint is the best way to do that on a node because taint is the only scheduling constraint that you can set up on a node, node level. Everything else is on a pod level. So you apply 
node selectors, you apply node names, you apply affinity rules, everything goes on a pod level. But if you want to apply a property at a, or define something at a node level, you have tames for that. So it is basically for that purpose. Is that clear? Uh, Follow-up questions? That was perfect, thank you. Perfect, okay. So that's about taints, and uh, you can have a toleration which is equivalent to that. If you want to understand this further, I have a lab on it. I will share it with you. It's about advanced spot scheduling. It's part of our course as well. If you go to the Kubernetes mastery course, it's part of that. But I'll share it here, which talks about all SCADAM scheduling things. So node selectors, node names, affinity, scheduler. You can, in fact, have a custom scheduler of your own, toleration and taints. So when you define a taint, so I've tainted a node saying that, hey, this is a uh, this is dedicated only for running worker. I'm just adding a label. Label can be anything. And then I say, uh, instead of no schedule, I have no execute. No execute, what it does, difference between no schedule and no execute is, the moment you say no schedule, from there onward, anything that you are trying to run will not get scheduled. No execute will do that. Plus, if there is anything running currently, it will evict all those spots out of that node as well. So that's no execute. Uh, that's a different, it's a stricter version of it. And then this is a toleration. So if I want to run a particular worker, let's say this is a worker, I want to run it on that node, I will say that, oh, this tolerates uh, the key uh, called as dedicated is equal to worker. So dedicated equal to worker. I tolerate this with this effect. So it will run on that node, basically. That's how you do it. Right, I've shared this uh, with you in case if you want to explore this further. That's about tone, taints, and uh, tolerations. Okay, let's now talk about how to upgrade the nodes and how do you upgrade the cluster basically? Not just nodes, right? Nodes as in you can upgrade the cluster, the um, control plane as well as the worker nodes. And how do we go about doing that? is uh, what I will demonstrate now. Let's find out what our cluster uh, version is right now. So when I run kubectl version, I do get the client version, which is 1.28, which is kube CTL version, and the server version, which is the control plane side, the API server and everything else, uh, that's running on 1.28. And the nodes, the kubelet version is this, get nodes, and uh, the nodes are running the kubelet on that is uh, running with this version 1.28. It's all same, uh, but see, this is kubectl. This is the server control plane. This is kubelet on each of the node, including the control plane. There are three different things. Remember that, okay? Now, how do we upgrade the nodes is I will first, the process is first to upgrade the control plane and the worker nodes after that. That's what you see here. You can search the documentation for the upgrade And we'll take you to the page. Yeah, upgrading Kubernetes class. Yeah, this is the one, right? So I want to go from one version to another, right? So first thing that I need to do is, uh, of course, there's some considerations you can go look look at. And uh, uh, first thing that we need to do is change the package repository because what happens is this. Uh, I'll show you the repository also. So. When I added the repository while installing Kubedium, that's why I wanted to show you how to install Kubedium. One of the steps was adding a repository. It goes in here. It is because we are using Debian-based systems. Uh, that is Ubuntu. So ATC, apt, sources.list.d. This is a directory in which we have the source for Kubernetes, uh, which points to a specific version of Kubernetes, Kubedium, everything, right? Which is 1.28. You can see that. This is what needs to be changed here. So changing the package repository means I need to first go and change this. This is the first step. I'm upgrading the control plane node. If you look at the cluster upgrade, okay, this is the sequence. Upgrade the primary node, control plane. Uh, if you have additional control plane nodes, you go ahead and upgrade those, and then you upgrade the worker nodes. Yeah, so in this case, uh, control plane and the worker node. That's the sequence we will follow. The steps would remain largely same. Uh, there are certain things which may be different, but apart from that, 
it's largely same. So changing package repository, there is a documentation here. You have to upgrade, update that file, basically. The one I showed you just now, that's the one you change. Yeah, this is the same file. Pager command is just a slightly different way of looking at it. But it's the same file, and you update that file. And uh, first thing that we do is change it to, we want to change it or upgrade it from 1.28 to 1.29. That's what I did. Yeah, now it is 1.29. Uh, I've updated the repository, so I have to run apt update or apt get update, whichever. When we update the repository configuration, it has to get the index of packages which are available in that repository. So that's what I did. And then I'm going to run that command, Madison command, and kubarium. Now what is available in my repository is 1.29.2 hyphen 1.1. This is a you know patch and so on. So this is the one I want to update to right now. If I run, show you kubeadm version, it's 1.28. Uh, there is a kube uh, ADM upgrade and you can let it generate a plan as well, which will show you what is the current version and what you can upgrade to and so on. Yeah. So as far as this is concerned, it thinks that 1.28 is the latest version because kube ADM is not been upgraded yet, right? So I've just updated the repository and now I will begin upgrading the cluster component, the control plane components, uh, beginning with Upgrading the kubeadm first. So this is the command on Ubuntu. And I have to find that specific version, 1.29.2. I'm copying that because I have to specify it here. Yes, and that's that. Uh, so this upgrades kubeadm. Nothing else has changed yet. I'll show you. So my client version, server version, same, okay? Nodes are same. Only kube ADM version is being upgraded, okay? Only that. But that gives me an upgrade plan now. Now that it knows about that version, it's gonna detect it has, and it tells me that this is the current version and you need to upgrade all of these components to 1.29.2. How do you do that is very simple. Now that I have it done, so uh, upgraded the kubeadm, kubeadm upgrade apply with that version goes and upgrade the server side components. We're talking about this part, okay? Server version. So it's just upgrading the control plane components like API server, controller manager, scheduler, group proxy, you know, core DNS, etcd. Etcd is the same version. Everything else is getting upgraded. And uh, that is what is happening right now. You see the cluster remains largely available. My applications are available. You can see that on the right. Uh, nothing has gone down. Uh, this is just a control plane upgrade, okay? When control plane is down, when control get, plane is getting upgraded, the current applications not necessarily go down, okay? That's something I want you to observe. Only if you are talking to the K Kubernetes API server and uh, returning some output, actually this is doing that. So if I refresh, it may have a blip of a downtime right now, but the application itself is not down. Uh, the backend components may be. Right? So for a blip of a time, actually. And it's uh, just doing all the upgrade right now. So you see on the right, there is a uh, problem because it is not able to communicate with the API server because all this information comes from there. Even though the web application will be available, the backend is not working for it, for this one. But if you have any other application, it will continue to work. 
So this is right now just upgrading the control plane component. That's all. Control plane node. You can see it's upgraded all the components and uh, it's waiting for the kubelet to restart these components. It takes a bit of a time. Kubelet itself has not been upgraded, but the server side components are. Uh, everything else which is running, right? Like API server, that city, control, uh, controller manager, those components are being upgraded, not the kubelet. Okay. This is done. Now, it says control plane is upgraded. You can proceed to upgrade kubelet, maybe kubectl if you want to. So what has been upgraded? What has been not? Get nodes. Kubelet is still not upgraded. That's why the version here doesn't change. Uh, kubectl version though, the server version, see the server version? That's what got upgraded, the control plane component. Neither the client nor the kubelet. It's time to upgrade that. And when I want to do that, uh, like there are a bunch of things which are being run via kubelet. So I need to first stop these components and so that they get distributed somewhere else uh, and get the ready, node ready for the maintenance. This is where we look at the maintenance commands uh, like drain, cordon, uncordon, etc. So there are a few commands here. You can see that in the uh, troubleshooting. No. Cluster management commands, right? So you have uh, uh, drain, cordon, uncordon, okay? Uh, so what does this mean, right? So cordon is like non-schedulable, that no schedule uh, kind of an effect, right? So what happens here when you say cordon is it stops scheduling any additional pods from now on, okay? Now we don't want that. We want to drain the pods as in we drain the differences. It will make it non-schedulable. It will also remove everything which is running on that node right now, right? That's the drain part. And uncordon will make it schedulable again. So cordon makes it non-schedulable. Uncordon marks it at schedulable again. So we will have to drain the nodes in order to upgrade kubelet, uh, specifically kubelet, right? So that's the command here. You can see that. So ignore daemon set is basically if you have anything running with daemon set, it will not remove it by default. So that's related to that. Right now it doesn't matter. We don't have any daemon sets running as far as our uh, applications are concerned. So which one I am uh, preparing and marking it to be uh, non skid level. I'll show you. Actually, let me start I'll open one more terminal to show you a few things. See the nodes here, observe they're ready right now. All of those are, I'm draining the cube one now. See what happens. One is it evicted all the pods, marked it as scheduling, non-schedulable. Those pods went away. The good thing about deployment is this. The application is resilient. Uh, the moment these pods got removed from here and this became non-schedulable, every other node is still running and that is schedulable. So those pods got distributed across whatever was available, right? That's just fantastic. Uh, that's how Kubernetes works. It's quite resilient. So you put, put a node on our maintenance. Uh, it's fine. I mean, it's just a, one of the compute instance and it just goes away. Uh, the pods get rescheduled somewhere else and application continues to run with the same capacity as well. I just marked it, prepared it for maintenance. And now I will upgrade uh, kubelet as well as uh, kubectl. So you have to unhold it. You have to mark it as you know, unlock it basically. And then you have to provide those commands. So uh, versions rather. So I want to find out what is version of kubectl. What is the version of kubelet? I can do that. It's the same version, but I just wanted to show you that both you can query using this 
apt cache uh, Madison command as well. And uh, this is what I want. I'll take a command like this, this one. And uh, then I just have to change the versions here for kubectl, kubectl, as well as uh, kubelet, which is here. And this is the time. Nothing is running there. No problem. You can run these upgrade commands. Nothing is nothing else is running via kubelet. Your additional ports that is. Your control bin still continues to exist and run. And uh, it's a, it's been upgraded. You can see that this has been upgraded to 1.29.1. .1, and now I will mark it schedulable again. This is where I'll say uh, uncord on. So when I say uncordon, that disabled scheduling is gone now. And this node is ready to take the pods if needed. And you will see that happen now. When I go to this next next node, uh, it will get distributed again. I'll probably go on kub1, kub3, gets distributed there. Now the control plane upgrade is complete. We'll go to the nodes and upgrade uh, those nodes basically. Upgrading Linux node is what I want to do, but the process is almost similar. You mark the node uh, as non scalable and then you upgrade everything there. So before that, I will go ahead and uh, what I'll do is on these two nodes, I will just do this simultaneously. No, I can't. Okay. Use a different approach. Changing the package repository is something I'll have to do for both. So the same similar set of commands. So I can also look at look it up in the history. And I upgraded or updated this file uh, to use 1.29. Same here. Done and uh, update the repository, upgrade kub, uh, kubadium. We'll have to go one node at a time while we actually upgrade later the kubelet that is. Uh, kubadium we can upgrade right now, that's not a problem. Uh, we just need the same version. So you have to begin upgrading Kubadium first which is done, it's just kubadium upgrade. And now I can upgrade the nodes, but before that, uh, or kubadium upgrade node, can run that. That's done. Uh, now I will start upgrading the actual kube, this part, the kubelet. Yeah, that's the important part. Now for this, I need to make the nodes non schedulable So I'll have to, you know, uh, let's say drain the nodes one at a time. So I'll do this one at a time. So I'll go with the second node first. See what happens now. When I drain the second node, this one, everything from there moved somewhere else, right? That's why we want to do it one at a time and uh, shows you the resilience of Kubernetes, right? So you basically, an application still remains available, uh, just gets moved somewhere else. 
I think that uh, uh, application, the visualizer was running on that node. So just moved somewhere else. So I had a downtime, but it's minimal downtime. And for this application, it's fine. So that's what you would observe when something like this happens. So you see, everything moved to one and three nodes. Now I can go to this particular node and upgrade uh, kubelet and the likewise. kubectl, kubelet, whatever is running there, that can be upgraded now. So we're safely upgrading the nodes one at a time. And you're gonna see this change to 1.29.1, yep. And it's time to make it available again using Uncordon. Scheduling disabled, it's ready, but not taking any pods. And that now would go away when I uncord on it. Even if you have an issue with a node and you want to troubleshoot it, you can just cord on it so that it becomes, uh, so basically cord on is just this, okay? Cord on doesn't evict or anything like that, right? So I will show you cord on 03. Uh, it is marked as non-schedulable, but has no impact on that 03. Nothing happened there. Nothing got drained or something like that, right? So we really need to drain it in order to uncord on first. Yeah. Uh, looks like there is some demon set, so we'll have to use this option. Yes, Google proxy is running as a demon set. I think that's the reason why we have to provide that option. So 03 is gone, and uh, you see the pod just moved here. And now this can be upgraded finally. That's should complete my cluster upgrade. After I uncordon it, right? Once it is ready and upgraded, I will go ahead and uncordon that, right? Now it is ready to take the pods. How do we make it take the pods? I can do one trick, which is kubectl rollout. Uh, I want to restart. I mean, recreate all these pods running for what application. Very simple command. There is no stop pods command. There is no stop deployment, but you can basically have them restart it across that deployment using a rollout restart command. There's a rollout restart. And here I can say deploy uh, web. Most of you might not have used it. But there is, there is a command which exists to do a, a restart across that deployment for whatever reason. I just wanted to reschedule it and spread it across now. And that's what happened here. So each of this is probably running five pods, uh, five or four pods, and approximately four, six, whatever the distribution is now. But everything is getting distributed properly. And uh, that's why I just restarted it. All right. So I showed you upgrading the nodes. We looked at uh, creating the cluster, joining the additional nodes, making uh, the master node schedulable. We learned how to upgrade the cluster from one minor version to another. And uh, finally, I will show you how to uh, set up a backup of HCD, which is a very, I think the favorite question on an exam is uh, HCD backup and restore, right? Okay, I'll take a question first. Um, there's a question from Cedric. Uh, so that means when you drain the control plane, the entire cluster keeps working on the current state since there are no, uh, yes. So what happens when you drain the control plane? That's the question. When the control plane drains, uh, everything else was run, still running. When it got became non-schedulable, everything else is still running. So it doesn't affect that at all. So all of those components still continue to run. In fact, some of the core components were also running uh, as I saw them, uh, at least for majority of the part, except for some. Uh, but even if the control plane goes down, your existing applications on the other nodes will continue to work. It's just that they will not get updated. If something happens, they will not be resilient. Um, they'll not take any other action apart from if you kill them, it's gone. So uh, that's what will happen. But it will run till, let's say, you can recover the control plane in the meanwhile, bring it back up, and it will continue to work. 
uh, as well. So that can happen. All right. Uh, on the YouTube live, if you have any questions, you can post them as well. And uh, let's say we have, uh, okay, there's a question from Joy. Shall we need to backup etcd for managed Kubernetes like EKS? Uh, you may want to set up etcd backup. Uh, no, if you don't have access to control plane, you don't need to do that. Um, and you may not have access to the control plane uh, components in certain scenarios, in which case you may not be able to do that either. either. Right. So in, in that case, you probably don't need to do that. If it is a managed environment, uh, cloud should take care of your uh, high availability part on the control plane side, actually. For all the other uh, you know situations, you still at least need to know, uh, and especially for CK, like an exam where you're administ give, providing an ad you know, appearing for an admin exam, uh, it is important to know how to backup and restore etcd, which is a simple process. Um, why it is important is because etcd contains the state of your cluster, okay? And that's why it is kind of an important uh, aspect that you should know how to back it up, how to restore it. And I'll quickly show you that part uh, of backing up and restoring. All right, there's a question from Cedric about uh, in real life environment, what is the common situations? Is do people use stack cluster or dedicated ECD cluster? Now, uh, just to clarify this question for a lot of other people who don't know what the difference between stacked cluster and um, a dedicated ECD cluster. So if you look at the high available setup of Kubernetes, one of the things that you make high available is ECD first. Let me show you. If you have a high available setup, typically uh, this is an example of a stacked cluster, meaning basically you have a control, you have control pin nodes, two or more, and you have etcd running on the same nodes. So etcd is sharing the same nodes that your control pin components are running. You can also have a dedicated etcd cluster, as in you have entirely different dedicated nodes running just etcd nothing else. And then rest of the control pin components continue to run here. Uh, that's a dedicated setup. Now, what I commonly see the most likely scenario you're going to find is like this, where you have a uh, stack cluster as in you have etcd as well as the rest of the components running on the same nodes. And you have maybe three, you know, like three control plane nodes, two control plane nodes uh, are possible as well. And uh, that's basically how uh, it looks like. You probably see the uh, options here. This is the stacked topology where etcd is running along with all the other components. You can see that you can have a load balancer on top of that and then you can connect your worker nodes through the load balancer. An external etcd topology means you have entirely different nodes running etcd and then you have control pane, so much larger uh, setup. Uh, so most of the times I've seen the stacked uh, uh, topology being used to answer that question. Now, how do we back it up? Let's find out. Okay, we're looking at operating at CD cluster uh, and we're gonna look at only the part where we talk about backups and restore. It is very simple. You just have to install a tool called as CD CTL, just like Coop CTL. Yeah, so backing up a cluster. How does it work? First of all, you need uh, this tool called as etcd CTL. Yeah, so if etcd CTL doesn't work, uh, what happens, right? So let me try this first. And you do this on the control plane only. We're talking about control plane node only now. All of this happens on control plane only. Uh, so it says etcd CTL is not there. You can install it using this command, which is very straightforward. So just etcd hyphen client install it. Once that is installed, once I have the command, right, I can start using it. Okay. It's a DCTL version and whatnot. So right now the Kubernetes uh, etcd typically has this version three, 
That's what we use for API version. That's what you see here. HCD, CTL API, what version? No, version three. And uh, uh, whatever. So this is the way you take the, uh, is that the way we take the snapshot? Hold on. Yeah, there are a few options we'll have to provide, yeah. So here. Yeah, uh, you'll have to provide certain options here. This is the validation, it works. And when I want to take a backup, I will typically do that using some options like this. So I have to provide uh, CSRT uh, certification, some backup file location can be any, and the key file. So there are three things at least we'll have to provide, right? Now, where does this information comes from is uh, from the pod running etcd. Where is etcd running? Is basically it's running as a, a static pod. The configuration for all this uh, created by Kubadium exists inside etc, Kubernetes, manifests, right? And this is where you'll find all the manifest pod specs for all the control plane components, including etcd. So in this file, I have this etcd.yaml. This is one way of finding out. You can also describe the pod and find out all these details as well from it, right? And what details you need, uh, there are three things. Cert file, we need key file, we need trusted CF file. So I'll just copy this and keep it somewhere for the time being. Yeah. Okay, now I take this command and uh, fill in the details. I'm gonna keep everything else as same. HCD is running on the same cluster server, same cluster, same uh, host as well. So I'll keep that as same. CSRT is uh, this one. There's a cert file. Trusted CF file. CSR is a trusted CF file. So I just have to provide these options, which are already given. Cert file is uh, this one in the key file. Can you show us how you generated that file again? Sorry. You're talking about this information? Yes. Uh, okay. This was basically the etcd configuration. Where did I pick it up from is the uh, etc Kubernetes manifest has etcd.yaml. This is the pod spec for etcd. So when etcd was launched, it was basically used using this particular YAML file. Hublet has a path. This is called a static pod manifest via directory. So if you want to run anything outside of scheduler, you can put the pod spec right inside this directory and it will automatically be picked up by its uh, kubelet and it will launch it. That's what it's, that's what it did with etcd. So etcd was launched with this. This is just a pod spec and the pod spec runs this container called as etcd with these options and these options are already there in that manifest. That's what I just copied here for the time being. Uh, just temporarily so that I can use the values here. Okay, thank you. Set so CD CTL endpoint. I'm going to keep that as is. I uh, provided those values and I want to provide the path. Let's say yeah, just some file name here. Okay, created the temporary database for etcd backup. And uh, it has done that, it saved it here. Okay, that's the value I shouldn't have seen it. 
uh, this cat catted actually. So this is just a data binary. And that's where the snapshot is. This is how you take a backup of etcd. How do you restore it is uh, uh, the process which is also given here. So similar command, okay, but you have to provide a data directory. Uh, what is the current data directory path? You can find it here. This is where the etcd data is being stored right now. This is where it is, okay? Now, when we restore, we'll have to restore it into some other directory, some other path we'll have to provide. That's uh, what it is asking for. So data directory wise, let's say I'll create a new one. Let's say day two, uh, snapshot, restore, and whatever file name here we had, I will restore this into that basically, okay? And what it does is it creates that directory while lab, uh, etcd2, similar thing, yeah. Uh, so it has extracted it here. If I want etcd2, switch to it. How could I do that? Is I'll have to go to the same place, etc. Kubernetes manifest, look at etcd configuration. If I want to change the configuration instead of varlib etcd, if I wanted to use etcd2, that's where I extracted that backup. This is what I'll have to do. And then it goes and uh, uh, kubelet picks up the configuration uh, and then restarts on its own. So you just have to wait for it and you will see it gone and then it will come back up later. That's uh, what is gonna happen basically. That's how it gets restored typically. And you see it's getting restarted. Most likely all these components etcd, APS server, all of those are getting restarted right now. And uh, that's what is documented here, uh, which you can find from this uh, document in a link as well. Right, it might come up in a minute or so. And uh, those are the things which are important uh, for you to know from the cluster administration point of view. One is how do you set up the cluster using Kubadium? What is the process? How do you add or join additional nodes. Uh, how do you make the master node schedulable, which is just another thing uh, I want to talk about. And upgrading the cluster is very important, especially from the exam point of view. How do you upgrade a cluster from one version to another? We saw it, it, can, it can, could have been a patch. It could be a major version. If it is a patch, you don't even have to change the repository. You just have to provide the version and upgrade. Uh, if it is a minor version upgrade, you follow the documentation or the instruction that I demonstrated with and uh, backing up and restoring etcd. How does that work? Uh, we've seen it, right? So it's going to take some time for it to come back up, but that's uh, what I wanted to uh, talk about today and uh, demonstrate to you. And this actually takes up two of the topics here as per our plan, uh, productionized admin of five. So this becomes nine plus 10 where we have taken uh, both of these topics and then this gets in here. So next week we will take a pargo and we should be done with our uh, 90 day challenge here where we started a long time ago talking about the basics of Kubernetes and we have come a long way and covered many different topics related to Kubernetes here. Uh, okay, any question again uh, from YouTube stream, from Zoom? There's a question from Dinesh actually. How would we know if the cluster is created using kubeadm or kind or any other way? Now you should know um, how it was created, right? Typically if a kind clusters are local. So you will typically see uh, kind being used in a dev kind of a local kind of an environment uh, where you'll find. There could be ways like looking at the configuration, um, kind might have its own footprint somewhere, of course. So you can find out with one way to do that is with Docker PS. And if you see a uh, Docker or something being installed and uh, your nodes are listed as containers, you definitely know if that is created by kind. Um, that's one way, one quick way to find out uh, for sure. Uh, apart from that, there would definitely be something uh, we'll have to figure out this part uh, of the question. So how 
uh, you can differentiate between kind versus the others. Uh, another question from Cedric is in real life production environment, what's the common backup topology? Do they backup at CD on PVC or external dedicated storage? Um, there are tools to set up HCD backups. So it's a good idea to store HCD backup somewhere else outside of the cluster nodes, because let's suppose if the nodes running HCD are down, uh, you lose your nodes, right? And you lose that HCD backup as well. You don't want that. So you should be storing them somewhere else. And there are tools which are dedicatedly created for HCD backups as well. Right, so storage wise, it can be anything. So you can use S3, for example, on cloud. Uh, if I have to store the backups, I would almost always use S3 or equivalent uh, object storage, uh, Azure Blob Storage, S3 on a AWS for storing my backups and then put it in the archive if I need to. Uh, the tool for etcd backup is, uh, let me remember that. This is a very popular tool, actually. I'll have to find out the name and uh, share it with you. Started with V, v I believe. Let's see the CTL, which is there, but uh, uh, there is definitely tool for uh, backing up at city. I will find out the tool name and share it with you uh, on Thursday call. Valero, yeah, started with V, right? So Valero. So this is the one I... Uh, Let me show you that. Yeah, this is the one. So you may want to look at this uh, for HCD. Yep. All right. All right, any other questions? from the UDF stream, from uh, Zoom sessions. All right, if not, we'll close the session. I think we'll um, be done next week. So next week, we'll take up our group. In terms of our uh, missions and uh, the membership and whoever is following the, our Kubernetes Bootcamp, uh, I will be adding the projects related to this mission for sure. Uh, there will be no project on HEM. Uh, we'll stick to only what is relevant from the certification exams for now. Uh, ergo, there will be no project. So it's more like a fun uh, utility, useful utility to know about, interesting utility as well. So we'll talk about that next week. We'll talk about two aspects of Ergo, Ergo CD and Ergo rollouts, both. And uh, then we should be done. In terms of the project and completion of the bootcamp, uh, you'll have projects still this part and uh, we should be done, right? It's not too much. So if you have been following... Uh, along, um, keep up with the projects and you be going to be done uh, next week. All right. So, um, all right. So the question is about configuration of the nodes. Sure. So I would share that uh, script with you. Just it's a freshly baked script because I had another script earlier, just modified it. So you can see that uh, revision just a uh, four hours ago. Uh, this should work with 1.28. You can change this to 1.20 and 9 if you want as well by changing a couple of components here and here, basically. But uh, this is the script or a user data for uh, put it on the YouTube as well. That's the one for node setup. And this sets up everything, including kubeadm for you. Right, container D, Kubeadium works with the latest version of uh, Ubuntu. All right, folks. So with that, we will. Uh, if there are no more further questions, we will close the sessions. All right, we're done. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Cedric. You should definitely put that on the trust pilot as well. Uh, the reviews. 
And uh, thank you so much. And I'll see you on, um, if you're a member, we'll be coming back on Thursday. Uh, if you're not a member, definitely consider being a geek member, uh, which gives you access to the courses, projects, and a lot more, including the community and a certification that we have on Kubernetes. Thank you. And uh, I'll see you in the next live session. Bye-bye.